I'm probably one of the few people, uh, or certainly that I know, that can actually enter a room and leave it without, and, and nobody will know that I've been there. I can just come in completely silently. I can turn the handle of the door. I can let myself in. I can sum up the situation and retreat, and nobody will know that I've been there. This is a, an acquired knack which I've never lost. I just kept out of the way, behaved myself, kept quiet. In that way, deflected wrath as, as much as I possibly could. I've probably gone through life to some extent expecting to be sort of hit over the head all the time. It's never happened, but I've worried about it as a possibility. This volcanic crater is about six miles north of Naples. It's the kind of unexpected and deserted place that Norman Lewis has the knack of finding. Besides his ability to fade into the background, he has the qualities you'd expect in the writer of travel books, a fascination with customs and superstitions, a sense of history, and an eye for the smaller details of life. But his books are more than straight reportage or travel journals, and Lewis himself is rather different from his polite and apparently deadpan exterior. He seems almost to attract the unexpected, the bizarre, and there's a peculiar Norman Lewis way of looking at things. It's his published war diary that has all the Lewis trademarks. Naples 44 was written in spite of a friend's admonition, at least spare us your war memoirs. That's something nobody wants to hear any more about. This is Naples, the capital of the former kingdom of Naples, one of the most beautiful of Mediterranean cities. Modern war is cruel to any city. It has been cruel to Naples. Long before the battle for the city itself, right from the days of Alamein and Marath, Allied bombers hammered military objectives in Naples with devastating effect. They bombed the harbor until the quays were a shambles and the roadstead was choked with sunken ships. In September 1943, I came ashore on the beach at Pestum, 10 miles south of Salerno very cautiously, because we hadn't the faintest idea of where the Germans were. We scrambled through the woods and then came out into the open. There, to our intense astonishment, we were confronted by these marvellous temples and the shock, the aesthetic shock was quite extraordinary. It was very exciting. September the 10th. A warm, calm morning. We set out to explore a little of our immediate environment and were admiring the splendid husk of the Temple of Neptune when the war came to us in the shape of a single attacking plane. Hearing its approach, we crouched under a lintel. The plane swooped, opened up with its machine guns and then passed on to drop a single bomb on the beach before heading off northwards. One of my friends felt a light tap on a pack he was wearing, caused by a spent machine gun bullet, which fell harmlessly to the ground. The experience was, on the whole, an exhilarating one. We appreciated the contrasts involved, and no one experienced alarm. Well, as soon as I got to Naples, I went to Casella's bookshop, and I bought an excellent print showing this temple and showing a splendid collection of buffaloes wandering around in the neighborhood. September the 18th, I saw a number of German tanks which had been put out of action by the naval shelling. Several of these lay near or in tremendous craters. In one case, the trapped crew had been broiled in such a way that a puddle of fat had spread from under the tank and this was quilted with brilliant flies of all descriptions and colours. 
possibly because I was an only child, possibly because I was extremely lonely. It was a great consolation to write about things and uh, it, to make them, to, to solidify them in my imagination, to assist me to, 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 to remember the pleasant experiences I'd had. And I think that's really how I became almost addicted to writing. Very shortly after Naples had been smashed to pieces in two tremendous air raids. And when I arrived, what struck me first of all was the absolute silence. People were walking around or not speaking at all. And when you spoke to anyone, they didn't reply. They were quite stunned. Now, in the outskirts of the town, they were all digging in the public gardens for roots. There was no food, uh, no water, and no electricity. And uh, on those rocks that you see all along the shore, they were prying off the limpets to, to cook up, boil up. And they were also making what I imagine to be a foredoomed attempt to distill water from the sea. Lots of people were doing this with the weirdest looking apparatus. I was forced every day to produce at the end of the day what was called in our particular section a log. And this meant going through the notes which I had made daily, which could be in a very chaotic form, and writing or typing those out in a legible, legible form for the data report, which was read at a meeting held next morning. But these are my original notes. Uh, uh, and reading back, I often, uh, I, I can't really re remember what they were all about. Uh, they're very, very disjointed. Uh, and uh, uh, every conceivable kind of thing used to happen in one day's work. I mean, it might be a, a chase after a spy who was almost always non-existent, or there might be sort of a mysterious trip across to Capri, or I might have to go and see some girl and decide whether she was a satisfactory mate for an Allied officer. These things that simply happen all the time, or there'd be odd explosions around the town, or there'd be uh, soldiers would be attacked by, uh, by civilians or vice versa. October the 4th. Somewhere a few miles short of Naples proper, soldiers, each of them carrying a tin of rations, were streaming into the municipal building. I followed them and found myself in a vast room crowded with jostling soldiery. Here, a row of ladies sat at intervals of about a yard with their backs to the wall. By the side of each woman stood a small pile of tins, and it soon became clear that it was possible to make love to any one of them in this very public place by adding another tin to the pile. The women kept absolutely still. They said nothing, and their faces were as empty of expression as graven images. E io il papà non c'era, stavo in guerra, boom, 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 boom. Ma, ma, ma. E giù a ricovere, boom, 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 boom. Ho fatto il triangolo, hai capito? People would come out of their houses seeing an Allied soldier standing around and asking him to come in and have a cup of coffee or a piece of bread and cheese or something like that, out of the, out of the natural goodness of their hearts. And because Neapolitans are a very, very friendly people. Uh, then, of course, the, the, the soldier would produce, uh, in, in a particular case, I'm thinking of a cutting uh, from the, uh, the military newspaper, which suggested that he should show this written in Italian to whoever it was he thought was accosting him, uh, often written in the most offensive terms. For example, fate attenzione, which means now look out. He said, I have no interest for your syphilitic friends, nor for your sister. Now, I love this bit. The, the Allied troops are in Italy, 
not to admire Vesu Vesuvius or to contract maladies. No, we are her here to win the war and to render Italy free again. Why don't you aid us? October the 28th. Neapolitans take their sex lives very seriously indeed. A woman called Lola asked if I could help her. It turned out that she'd taken a lover who was a captain of the RESC. But as he speaks no single word of Italian, communication can only be carried on by signs. And this gives rise to misunderstanding. Would I agree to interpret for them and settle certain basic matters? She'd made him understand by gestures one could only shudderingly imagine that her late husband, although half starved, and even when in the early stages of tuberculosis from which he died, never failed to have intercourse with her less than six times a night. She also had a habit which terrified Captain Fraser of keeping an eye on the bedside clock while he performed. I recommended him to drink, as the locals did, masala with the yolks of eggs stirred into it, and to wear a medal of San Rocco, patron of Coitus Reservatus, which could be had in any religious supply shop. March the 19th. Today, Vesuvius erupted. It was the most majestic and terrible sight I have ever seen or ever expect to see. The smoke from the crater slowly built up into a great bulging shape, having all the appearance of solidity. It swelled and expanded so slowly that there was no sign of movement in the cloud which by evening must have risen 30 or 40,000 feet into the sky and measured many miles across. At the time of my arrival in San Sebastiano, the lava was pushing its way very quietly down the main street. About 50 yards from the edge of this great, slowly shifting slag heap, the crowd of several hundred people, mostly in black, knelt in prayer. Holy banners and church images were held aloft and acolytes swung censers and sprinkled holy water in the direction of the cinders. Occasionally, a grief-crazed citizen would grab one of the banners and dash towards the wall of lava, shaking it angrily, as if to warn off the malignant spirits of the eruption. In this church here, San Pasquale, we have one of the most beloved of all Neapolitan saints and one of the most powerful, the Blessed Egidio. One thing he did which endeared him all the more to Neapolitans was to raise from the dead a cow which had been stolen by a local butcher and cut up. The saint prayed over the dismembered portions of the cow for 15 minutes or so, sweating profusely. Catherine was the cow's name, and at the end of that time he said, Catherine, I command you to rise, and Catherine got up, lowed, and walked away. October the 24th, a visit to the civilian prison of Poggio Reale. A man appeared carrying an enormous bunch of keys to walk with me to the inner gate. The man made some comment in Neapolitan dialect, which I didn't understand, and then burst out laughing. He gave me the impression of being insane. When we got to the gate, he turned his back to it, and then, still giggling and chatting incomprehensibly, his hands behind his back, selected the right key on the bunch purely by touch, thrust it unerringly into the lock and turned it. This was evidently a macabre piece of expertise to which all visitors such as myself were treated. There's a criminal trial here the biggest ever held of some 650 members of the Camorra, a secret criminal society which is the Naples equivalent of the Sicilian Mafia. What comes as a surprise is this massive hall, which reminds me a bit of a session of the United Nations combined with an up-to-date zoo. I had a rather ringside view of the Mafia operation in southern Italy. The Sicilian invasion was very largely assisted by Mafia intervention. 
This was arranged in the United States by the co-chief of the Mafia, Lucky Luciano, at that time in prison there. The other co-chief of the Mafia was Vito Genovese, who was to become advisor to the Allied military government. You could say that Vito Genovese practically ran southern Italy. Um, he, uh, the mayors, which were then appointed by the Allied uh, forces, were the names were supplied by Vito Genovese, and all of them were, in the case of Sicily, ex mafia, or in the case of the southern Italy, Camaristi. Now, it was very interesting to watch this process happening, uh, and uh, I, when, uh, when the war was over, and when I had the opportunity to do so, I made further investigations. And in this being slightly aided, possibly, uh, because I had certain Sicilian uh, connections of my own, uh, and therefore could see people in Sicily and who could help me round. These, 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 these men are just animals. Some are extremely abusive. Uh, you know, they, they, they appear to be dazed and browbeaten. Uh, and notice the way they're sort of pacing up and down, as if they, they a fearful scream like an, like an ape. Uh, pacing up and down to get extra exercise. There's a distraught woman down here. Looks, she looks absolutely wild out of her mind. Uh, just imagine a woman in the Camorra. Look at that face. The man next to her holding her hand through the bars. Uh, the wild, sort of distant expression in the eyes. This man here with his hands through the, uh, the bars is extremely angry and has all shouted terms of abuse at me. Uh, I expect, you know, I expect they're probably kept in something like close confinement and solitary confinement. And even the, to get out here and walk around and look at the public is, is, is a bit of an excitement, a bit of a change. Non è galera, no. Ho perso il conto. Sono otto anni e mezzo. Otto anni e mezzo. A dentro? Sì. Perché? E... Per quale reato? Sì. Tutto il codice. Vado tirato a preso. Eh. Cioè, sì. Anche omicidio, se questo. Sì, sì. Sono sposato? No. no. Eh... Allora diciamo all'Inghilterra che ci sposiamo. <ride> no, eh, ci sposeremo. Um, I married, I married a Sicilian wife uh, and uh, I lived uh, in Bloomsbury off and on uh, in their family for several years. We, we, we all knew each other very well. I, I was accepted as a son of the family. They were extremely kind to me. I liked them very much. So I had a little experience of the Mafia in action in southern Italy. And um, I, I really had some inkling into the uh, workings of the Sicilian mind in England. And those, t those two factors in combination really sort of drove me to write a book on the subject. <laughs> Twelve of us NCOs plus an officer have to deal with the security problems of Naples while the delayed action bombs left by the Germans are still exploding all over the city. Never before in the short history of the Corps had one of its sections been confronted with an emergency of this order. This was chaos, babel, anarchy, the streaming of a million distraught human ants in their shattered nest. I took a day off in 1944 from the misery and the chaos of Naples, borrowed a jeep, came out here, and found this place as deserted and unvisited then as it appears to be now. 
The road passed within yards of the cliff cavern of the Sibyl, visited for counsel in their hour of extremity by so many emperors and kings of the Mediterranean world. Virgil speaks of its hundred entrances and as many issues, when sound in many voices the oracles of the prophetess. Standing there at the mouth of this tremendous chambered corridor, cut deep into the rock, it was entirely possible to believe this. Down through the openings in the cliffs, their faces pitted with innumerable caves and sanctuaries, lay the ruins of the most ancient of the Greek colonies in Italy. Here the spell remained, and here the sense of the grandeur of the past was overwhelming. The cavern itself seems to me to be a pretty remarkable piece of ancient engineering, built presumably in about 1000 BC. And what I would say is that it's made a greater impact on my imagination than any other place in the world. And I find it extraordinary to think that the kings and emperors of the East used to come here to consult the oracle of the Kumai Sibyl. And that this grey-haired, fiery-eyed, half-demented old woman was sitting here in this cavern a few yards from where we're sitting and talking to each other now. And she could hold in our hands the destiny of nations. It's 110 yards long. And what is more extraordinary is that roughly parallel with it, at a low depth, is yet another passage, three quarters of a mile in length, very similar to this. And this passage goes all the way to the lake of Avano, uh, which is considered in those days the entrance to hell. And it was along this passage that the Sibyl conducted Aeneas on his way to the underworld. What a wonderful view. That used to be the first Greek settlement in Italy, found in about 700 BC. Fantastic. Ah, oh, fennel. Fennel. Well, I know a marvelous recipe for this. I got it in Sicily. Broad beans, peas, a little onion, and a little fennel, not too much. I'll take that back with me. October the 23rd. A tremendous scare this morning, following information given by a captured enemy agent that thousands of delayed action mines would explode when the city's electricity supply was switched on. An order was given for the whole of Naples to be evacuated. Within minutes, army vehicles were tearing up and down the streets, broadcasting instructions to the civilian population. The scene as the great exodus started and a million and a half people left their houses and crowded into the streets was like some biblical calamity. Our activities have been hampered and even frustrated by false alarms and scares of every conceivable kind, all of which encouraged the growth of disbelief, so that when a few days ago reports began to come in about mysterious knocking sounds coming from the depths of the earth, we were unimpressed. It was the police's theory, supported by much rumour and some credible evidence, that a picked squad of German SS had volunteered to remain behind after the German retreat from Naples, and that they had hidden in the catacombs, from which they might, at any time, make a surprise sortie. You had these uh, rollicking soldiers rushing about the place and shining extremely powerful lights and shouting down these holes in the ground and running up these alleyways and uh, almost succeeding in losing themselves. And then you had, you could retire into the corner of Basilica, which probably remained untouched for a thousand years. And there, there were the bones in there and the niches of many hundreds and possibly thousands of persons. A few days later, there were no further complaints of knockings at all. So it was to be assumed that the Germans had died of starvation or, of course, that they'd been aided to escape, possibly by the monks who'd been so angry to see us there. When the Allied authorities were ready to turn on the power, they ordered the people out of the city. For this was the moment of greatest danger from Nazi time bombs and booby traps.
October the 24th, the thunderbolt has fallen. Today I was ordered to prepare to leave immediately for Taranto to embark on the Reina del Pacifico for Port Said. There will be no time for a last coffee substitute in the Grand Café and the Galleria to say goodbye and good luck to several girls who are virtually fixtures of the place and bear me no ill will because I was unable to help them marry allied personnel. I do my packing in the bedroom, trying as I do so to imprint on my memory all the details of the piazza. There won't be even a half hour to spare for a dash up to the Vomero for a last panoramic view across the gardens of the Villa Floridiana, of the great grey and red city spread below, presenting at this distance a totally fallacious aspect of dignified calm. Or for a final contemplation of the somnolent Vesuvius, so changed in outline since its reshaping by the eruption. I went into the office to gather my papers together and write the day's report, realizing with sorrow how many projects had been started but will now never be completed. On BBC One now, there's international snooker from Wembley, accepting viewers in Scotland who will be joining slightly later at 11.20. Now on BBC Two, it's time for Newsnight. Obviously a major malfunction. Good evening. I guess we all knew, said former astronaut Senator John Glenn tonight, I guess we all knew there would be a moment like this. In the worst disaster in manned spaceflight, America's shuttle has exploded and the seven crew are presumed dead. We'll be examining in detail how the tragedy occurred just a minute into the 25th shuttle flight and asking the question, can the embattled shuttle program survive a disaster like this? And from Washington, I'll be reporting on the future of the American space program after its worst disaster ever. There'll be reaction from the Kennedy Space Center and from the president himself in a speech delivered tonight from the Oval Office. The crew of the Space Shuttle Challenger honored us for the manner in which they lived their lives. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of Earth to touch the face of God. The Electricians Union tonight comes a step closer to expulsion from the TUC. The TUC appeals to its members not to cross printers' picket lines, with a full report on today's moves in the fight between Fleet Street and Wapping. All that plus a roundup of today's main news from home and abroad. In the whole short history of manned spaceflight up to this morning, 25 years of it, just seven astronauts, American and Russian, had died. Today, that number was doubled in one shocking split second at Cape Canaveral. The shock was all the greater for the way it came at the beginning of what looked like just another routine flight of the space shuttle. It was a brisk, clear day at the Cape, and millions of American television viewers watched live what has now become a commonplace event. Until just over a minute after the launch of the Challenger, one of America's four shuttles, this happened. The goal for auto sequence starts. 